All right, y'all, what's up? How y'all been? It's been a minute. Seen a few, see a few new faces, a few older faces. I know this is going to pop up. A few people that I've met in passing. I'm glad y'all here. Uh, this is Frame. It's a private class. Yeah, about three years ago. Well, the class has been going since the beginning of five, ten, maybe. Right. But we took it over last yeah. year. And we made it frame, you know what I'm saying? So this is the third year, third installment. COVID kind of had us moving a little slower, but these things is kind of lifted, becoming semi-normal. We, we're we back. Um, so we talk, we just, we talk about photography. Uh, we teach photography. And in the beginning, we covered kind of just a lot of general photography concepts, kind of just like worked on mindset things, right? But as you all signed up for, this is going to be essentially the portrait photographing people version. So welcome to Frame 2.8. We're diving into just how to photograph people and how to study the human experience through photographs. Um, the reason we're here. We should introduce our friend coming up right now, Mr. Train. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, Mr. Tra See, I thought she was being funny with Terrence oh. walking in the room. Oh, so. Yeah, for those online that haven't been to the studio, we are right next to a train track. So we will take intermittent breaks and pauses while the train is going. So bear with us. Uh, the train is just a part of the set. So we'll hold for this train to pass. We need a train graphic every time a train pop up. Like <laughs> 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 a little elevator music. <laughs> I'll be for sure making one. <laughs> okay, so, well, the reason we're here, we saw a lot of people, it was pure beginners, couldn't operate a camera to save their life, right? Get really good towards the end of the sessions. It was like, okay, cool. And Brooke, she'll probably be here later. Um, this is one post she made pretty much after class was done, like during our workshop. It's basically talking about how she wish she knew how to photograph people, interact with people more. And I was like, you know what? That's a valid claim. Because I remember when I first started out doing photography myself back in 2009, and I was assistant one dude named Shane Nash, one of our mentors. I was pretty prof I was proficient with the camera. I knew how shutter speed worked. I knew how aperture worked. I knew how to work the camera. And it was time for me to actually do a photo shoot, I would hesitate. I'm like, because I don't know what to do. Like, what the hell am I doing? Like, yeah, I know how to take a picture, but how do I do a photo shoot? Or how do I just inter even interact with a human and be present? So this is what this class is stemmed from. Um, so we'll cover a lot of the basic stuff, but a lot of it's going to be rooted in how to photograph people. Um, so the goal is essentially give you all the juice. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like. <laughs> It's like, yeah, we're going to cover, by the time we're done, everybody's going to be able to take a photograph, be able to interact and navigate the human experience and get the photographs you want. That's the goal of this class. So the goal is to help take the mystery out of photographing humans, right? I feel like a lot of us feel like it's some sort of cheat code, some sort of all this extra stuff that we need to learn. And it does get a little complicated, but our goal is to codify it and make it as easy to follow and break down. Because we're not going to cover everything, but by the end of this class, you'll have enough tools to be able to see a photograph and pretty much break it down and know what's going on and how to replicate it for yourself. So this is the crew. It's me, Cola. He's not here right now. He'll be in and out because he's got a bar going on, but he will be here. Kev's in, Kev's in Amsterdam right now, being a super rapper. And Scott is here with us. Um, they made me take that photo. <laughs> I'm not that cool in real life. Oh, What's up? What's up? <laughs> um, and with that, that's about almost 50 years of photographic experience for real. Like, and that's kind of the cool thing about this class. It's not one person, not one perspective. Um, even though we all kind of gel because our community has allowed that for us to happen because we're around each other all the time. But 
we all have different strengths and different viewpoints. We all do different things. And we all bank on each other to learn from each other to enhance our own skill set. So that's what we're trying to build here as well. Um, you also have Josh back there on the switcher, helping out with the technical stuff. He'll pop in and out and give his remarks here and there. Um, Chastati is helping out. He's at the door right now. He's helping out with a lot of technical stuff as well. So he's here. Um, and this is not a photo class, right? It's like, yeah, we're not, we're your teach we're not your teachers, but we're more or less the shirts that's leading you on a journey, right? We are all, there's no gurus. You could challenge anything we say. What we say is not finite. And if there's nothing you comprehend, make us slow down and break it down because our bias is that we've done it for so long and we live in our head. So to transfer it is a skill in itself. So we may be thinking we're transferring it at a level. It's like, no, actually we probably need to break it down or, or make distill it a little more. These are not your classmates. This is not a classroom. This is not a classroom at all. These, this is a community that we're building amongst each other to all go help us get through one journey and achieve one goal, right? So with that, one of our major tools is gonna to be Mighty Network. I know it might get a little cumbersome learning a new app at times, and it's like, why don't we just do Facebook or Instagram? It's a lot of distraction on those platforms. You could be doing a lot of other things thinking you're about to do photo, go into photo, go into frame and be like, you know what? Oh, I saw this meme and now I'm in this thread cussing this person out, right? This is for one for us to build community and excuse me, just so we can focus. Um, this is a real cool platform once we get into it. So if you haven't made it to Mighty Network yet, take down the link and take down the link and we'll make sure that you get in in. If you've signed up online and you haven't seen a Mighty Network email come in, check your spam. Because a lot of the hey, emails with the spam. Everybody online has to have seen the Mighty Network because this is on the Mighty Network only. Ah, uh, plot twist. Uh, okay, wait, but, quick question, but there are people that's popping up that haven't signed up yet. Yeah, yeah, everybody here is in the Mighty Network though, right? Yeah. Did, when you got the invite, did it go to your spam box? It did. Okay, so we got to address that. We have a lot more people who are signed up, but we're not sure who's getting stuff or not. So, All right. um, okay, cool. All right. Uh, one thing that I really want to push home about the Mighty Network is do not use the cheer button. <laughs> if you feel a way, you feel like you want to hit the cheer button, engage. Right? Figure out why you want to hit that cheer button so you can start building that dialogue. Because hitting the cheer button on a photograph or a thought or a post isn't doing you or them any service, right? It's just it's Instagram culture. We hit it like move on. No, engage, right? Train. So yeah, engage. There's no pressure to feel like you're right or wrong. Um, don't feel like anything you post have to be the magnum opus of your career because I feel like Instagram and social media make like we always have to post something that's worthy for praise, right? This is not the space for that. This is for all of us to grow. Like, if you feel like you need help and you posting it, ask for help. And there will be a gang of people in the comments coming to help you. It always happens. That's how a lot of the beginners got good quick. It was like they post stuff and like, I don't know what's going on. My white balance, I think, is off, and this, that, and the third, and comments get berated with things to help them out. And by the next time they come to class, they didn't figure it out. So, am I going the right direction? Oh, yep, I am. Okay. This is not a classroom. <laughs> this is just a part of the journey, right? This is not a class. We're sitting here a little more formal today because it's the intro, but the reason we moved to Saturdays is so we could do a lot of stuff in tandem with sitting here going over slides. So there'll be a lot of workshops, there'll be a lot of days where we're outside, like right after this. 
and just a breakdown of how these 10 weeks are going to be structured. Um, today, intro, exposure triangle. Next week, we'll be going over composition, and that day we'll be doing a photo walk at the same time. So it would be a longer class, but pretty much after you get outside, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Week three, portrait fundamentals. It's one of my favorite classes we've done. Then we'll start getting into light week four, just understanding light, starting to see it, how does it work, and just the grand scheme of how it works in the world. Because with that, you'll be able to see how it works when you're using it with week six, with a strobe and ambient, strobing and combining it with ambient light, and week five, where you're doing natural light portraits. And all, that's, all those skills are transferable in the studio. So basically, we're building we're just going, it's building blocks, right? So it's building, <laughs> you threw me off. There's building blocks. If you think about algebra, when you was learning algebra as a kid or in high school or whatever, stuff you learned in chapter one and two and three, when you got towards the end of the book, it was, it, the end of the book seemed foreign, but there was always pieces that you were able to make out, right? And this is pretty much the building blocks for that. And so week seven, week eight will be studio. Week nine will be gel photography because everybody has a lot of questions about that, but we can't get into that without building the, without building the foundation. Then week 10, where a lot of us struggle and are going to forever struggle and always are critique, always trying to perfect is how to interact with the sitter, talent, model, et cetera, and running a photo shoot. Um, your mic is dropping in and out, so we might have to use this a little bit too. Okay. So, just so you know, can you you can hear me on this now? We're good. But yeah, okay. is the 10 week progression it is always subject to change because we're ever growing and ever changing. But it's, it's pretty much dialed in, I would say, unless the class, what, unless the class is end up going in a completely different direction just because of what you all need and we start to see what's happening, we'll make that adjustment. Um, essentially though, photography is pretty easy. I know, especially when it comes to and all the technical ramifications that come with it is like, okay, this seems hard, but in this, once you learn how to do it, it's super easy. Anybody could take a photograph, right? Like once you learn how to set ISO, shutter speed, aperture, you're 40% of the way there, right? It's like learning how to cook. It's like, if you had to cook, if your life depended on it, you could put something on a fire and make it edible, right? But you see a chef do the same thing, and it's, how did he get that to work? It's just, it's, it's just time and experience and understanding the nuances of how the system works, right? Photography is the same way. So we sit there and look at images, and we go, I don't understand why that image looked like that. Because at the end of the day, a lot of your favorite photographs are very simple photographs. A lot of these photographs, some of my favorite, favorite photographs, they're one light. And you sit there and think, I had the same light and I had a person there and my I don't feel like my photo could get there. And there's a reason for that. Um, with it being easy, there's a caveat, right? It gets easy, you learn it quick, you feel like that's all you need, and you feel like there's nothing else to learn, so you stagnate. You feel like, there's nothing else I could do, so then I quit, <laughs> right? Um, but there's far more that goes into it than just the camera technical and the lighting side. And we're gonna get into a lot of that for this class as well. Essentially, photography is a physical manifestation of mindfulness. If you think about any art form, right? Painting, building something, you have to essentially make it. It's not in front of you. With photography, it's what your mind is privy to, 
and your understanding of what's going on, you hit the shutter button and that's being recorded, right? You ever been in a situation where you're with somebody and they take a photograph, you're like, I did not see that. It's their, aware, their awareness and mindfulness that put them in that space and the same for you. So with that, that's, pro that's probably the biggest part in photography, especially photographing people, is being mindful and being aware of what's going on in the situation. Oh, boom. I know, because we tell people this all the time when we're shooting, and it's like, I'm doing it right now. I felt myself doing it, too. <laughs> um, so with that, we're going to give you a couple tips and tools of the journey to just kind of have in the back of your mind when engaging this class and going through this 10-week journey, right? So be an amateur, no matter where you think you are right now, no matter how much of a pro you are, no matter if you've done photo shoots for ESPN, Vogue, you've been shooting for 50 years, approach it as an amateur if you're here, and just in general, because that's gonna keep your mind open and uh, raise your mind. Once you're not an amateur, you have a certain way of doing everything all the time, and you're cutting yourself off of all the other possibilities that can happen. Um, you have the permission to fail. You have the permission to brick. Don't feel like every photograph has to be a good photograph. While you're learning, there's no such thing as bad photograph. It's only a bad photograph. This is what I tell myself. It's only a bad photograph if I didn't learn something from it. So just shoot photograph and collect data. That's all you're doing because now you're just building a bank of things for later on. Be a photographer. A photographer, not a landscape photographer, not a photographer, not a film photographer that wears a fedora and shoots a Sumacron 35 and I wear Birkenstocks while I'm shooting. Just be a photographer. I know this is a portrait class. Huh? Oh, I know this is a portrait class, but, and I know there's a lot of people that Maybe like I'm just doing this because I want to learn something new, but I'm actually, I actually like doing still lifes or this, that, and the third. I like doing landscape, but there's a lot of skills that's always transferable from every discipline from photography to from one to another. So just be a photographer. Focus and deliberate practice. This is a big one, um, especially as a beginner. There's so much going on and there's so much tech here that comes and there's so many other things that we want to do. There's so many things we see on the internet. It's while you're on this journey through this class, being that this class will be forever going, so you don't feel, don't feel like you have to learn everything this go around. Find one or two things you know that you want to work on and just work through it through this whole session. A lot of stuff will fill in just through being here, then the next class, Work on another thing the whole session. So, who got who shoots on the zoom lens right now? Nobody shoots on the zoom lens. Oh, look at y'all. Who knows what a zoom lens is? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> they might know if they have a zoom lens or not. Who doesn't know if they don't have zoom, they do have a zoom lens or not? Okay. Do your lens zoom? Can you zoom the lens? to get a wide shot and a close-up shot without moving your feet? Yes. Yes, that is a zoom lens. Okay. Ah, okay. You say you don't have a camera? Is it? That's okay. You have a cell phone? You have, you a, have a camera. Phone? Boom. <laughs> With a zoom lens. <laughs> um, if you can, look into prime lenses and hit me just offline too. And find one lens you want to stick to for the majority of this class. Ideally, you want something that looks like Right. Camera you can control easy. If you don't have them, it has like the dial for each thing. That's fine. Um, it works. Yeah. So if you don't know what you have or you want suggestions for your camera, let us know, and we'll gladly give you a suggestion that won't break the bank. Um, but yeah, you got to. In order to learn photography, you have to learn how to see as the camera sees. So with you zooming in and out, it gets real hard to understand what's going on, how you like to see 
and to develop just a way of seeing in the world, right? Because now you're zooming the camera in and out. Oh, this uh, this panel here. Thank you. Um, yeah, deliberate practice, um, deliberate play. Being that photography is easy and it's fun, make sure that you're whenever you're working on whatever you're you decided to focus on, make sure it's deliberate practice. Make sure that you're going out with the mindset that I'm going to work on this today. Um, there's an exercise we're going to do today. Yeah, we're going to do exercise. It's an exercise that I've incorporated into my practice, and we'll get into it. And it's I do it every day. Like it's one of the things I do make before I leave the house, and I just I do it in the house or in the yard. But it's literally me just focusing on one aspect of photography that I know that I want to work on. Shoot or shoot. Just keep shooting. Shoot a lot of photographs. That's the only way you're going to get better. That's the only way you're going to get better. If you feel like you don't have time, you have a cell phone, you have 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day throughout the day while you have your cell phone collectively, just take photographs. You don't need your fancy camera to do it. If you're shooting film or you shoot a lot of film, depending on where you're at, at, where you're at in the journey, if you feel like you are stagnating, you feel like you need to, you feel like you're hitting a wall, you probably need to shoot more photographs so you can collect more data. Um, there's times in your journey where you might need to shoot film because you might need to slow down. And it's just being honest with you, where you're at, right? And that leads us to the next one, awareness and perspective. And when I say this, awareness and perspective on where you're at in the journey right now, not necessarily awareness of the world, right? This is all in, inside yourself. It's kind of knowing where you're at, knowing what you want to get out of the class, what you want to get out of your photography in general, and being honest on what steps you might need to take to get there. Because a lot of times we run from the stuff that is difficult for us, and it's really just being honest with that. And as a beginner, if you're starting off in this class right now, you're going to grow very fast, right? You'll get, it's like a video game. Like in Sonic or Mario, levels one through five is relatively easy, right? That's y'all, the beginners, right? You're going to get to level five fast as hell. But the people that's like at level five or at level eight, it's, it gets harder to get to level nine, level 10. <laughs> or Terrence knows what's up. Uh, in jujitsu, like I'm a fan, I practice. As a white belt, you're going to pick up, a, the white belt knows the same as the black belt. Everybody has the same knowledge set. But as you move through the belts, you're just refining what you do in one or two, three areas and then becoming a master at it. And so that's all you're going to do. You're just going to kind of find your lane and just you'll be you'll have everybody's going to have the same knowledge by the end of the class and it's just up to you to to uh, find that niche of really what do you, are you a gel light photographer are you a natural light photographer do you like to use strobes more often like you'll figure stuff out as we go yeah and you'll hit plateaus at certain times and when you're a beginner that plateau takes way longer to hit when the longer you're shooting, the quicker that plateau comes. And the gains get real incremental. And it's just knowing that those gains are super incremental, you have to fight for the next level. Like right now, personally, I, I talk to Terrence, I talk to Josh all the time, like just fighting through it and trying to figure out new ways to grow and new ways to figure it out. So there's a lot of tricks and tips depending on where you're at to grow and to progress. But just know if you're at a certain level, if you're at a higher level in this class and you feel like, oh man, I don't feel like I'm growing right now, there's a ways to figure it out. And it's twos and fews, right? It's like a penny here, a penny there. You look up in a year, you have 365 pennies, right? The beginners are gonna get a quarter here, a dollar here, five dollars here, right? So just being mindful of that part of the journey for yourself and not beating yourself up because you feel like once you hit a certain level, I'm not getting any better because you are. It just takes a little longer for it to show up. Um, we're gonna hold for this train. Oh, 
Okay. Does this work? <laughs> All right, bet. Your, your musical career. Rudy, what's up, bro? Beginning your musical career right now. Um, and and the last thing before we get into the technical mumbo jumbo is Obi's Law. Obi is a photographer. He's a Dutch photographer, I want to say. Yeah, he's Dutch. Um, came came in. He's been shooting probably for about sixty years at this point, and. As photographers, we, and as artists, we take shit too serious a lot of the times. And that stifles our creativity. So uh, it's basically his point saying that we should just have fun. And it's the pursuit of fun in our journey as photographers, right? If we're chasing a goal or we're chasing a benchmark, you're probably not going to get there. But if you're chasing the fun and just a p sheer enjoyment of making photographs, you will forever grow. Um, is there any questions in the building? Is there any questions online? Um, so this is essentially just kind of the mindset going into the class, kind of where we all, where we all play at, and a lot of my peers play at. Kind of just wanted to share that with you all, so we can start getting into the hard stuff. Um, anything you want to say? Okay, so we're going to do a break real quick for like five, ten minutes. Find somebody new that you don't know here. Find out what their favorite, what, how do I say this? <laughs> <laughs> their favorite fast food meal is that they feel bad about. That guilty pleasure. What's your favorite fast food guilty pleasure? People online, post your name and your fast food guilty pleasure. I'm serious, find a new person you don't know, and I'm gonna ask you when we get back what that person's guilty pleasure is. It doesn't matter. Pianchi, OG Pianchi, it doesn't matter, man. <laughs> oh, okay. Rook? Yes. I already know she's from Chicago. Of course, she uh, likes White Castle. <laughs> <laughs> That's the home.
Are you ready? Can you hear me? How do I sound? My mic sounds nice. Check one. Right. Um, okay, so welcome back. Frame 2.8. Let's get into it. Let's see. Anybody seen this movie? Yeah? Last Black Man in San Francisco. Amazing film. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, so, oh shit. Breaking the thing already. Um, hold on. There we go. All right, Q and A. Naima, <laughs> you're right in the middle, <laughs> and you're in the front row. Okay. All right. Who's your person, and what was their guilty pleasure? Sergio and um, Sourdough Jack. Sourdough Jack. Okay. Nice. Sergio, did you talk to somebody else besides Naima? Okay. All right. Crystal, who was your person and what was their guilty pleasure? Claudette. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I'm sorry. I don't know your name. Carlana. Who was your person? What was their guilty pleasure? Chili cheese fries from Winners. That sounds like heartburn. <laughs> um, I'm trying. Mine is Taco Bell. It used to be the Mexi Melt, but then they got rid of the Mexi Melt, and so now I got to get the cheesy roll up and add beef and tomatoes. <laughs> so, anyways, all right. Uh, how you guys feeling? You good? Who's nervous? Anybody nervous? No. Everybody settled in now. Carlana, are you nervous? <laughs> Terrence, are you nervous? All right, okay. Um, this is a process. We're all going to go through it together, like Dre was saying. Like, there, we're no master teachers. We're no, like, special people. We just have had the camera in our hand longer than the rest of you. Um, so just take it day by day. It's a process. I'm going to fuck some shit up today. Pardon my language. Um, and, it, yeah, it's a learning experience. We'll all, all do this together. And if there's anything you don't understand, put a hand up. I'm more than happy to do the best that I can to help explain the situation. So with that, what is exposure? <laughs> Would you have us any other way? <laughs> Whose fault was this, though? <laughs> it was Justin's fault, right? It was Justin's fault. OK. Camera exposure is the amount of light that reaches, oh shit, wait, hold on. What's exposure? <laughs> you got half of it. Somebody got an answer for me? Terrence? Uh, the amount of light uh, that hits the bits in the individual frames or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Camera exposure is the amount of light that reaches the film or camera sensor when a picture is being taken, right? So how much light is coming into our camera? What is the exposure triangle? Anybody got an answer for this? Sergio? Shutter speed, aperture, you got two-thirds of the way there. Anybody know what the last third of the exposure? ISO, correct. So this is the exposure triangle. This is the hardest thing that you're going to learn about photography, literally. But if you, yeah, right, I should have put Jay on there. But if, um, if you can figure this out, and it's not as complex as it looks. This is just it in all of its complexity. If you can figure this out, then you know how to be a photographer. I mean, on the technical side. The rest is all intuition and, and your creativity. So we have three parts. We have our aperture, which is our f-stop, our shutter speed, and our ISO. And so we're going to get into that. Uh, and I'll put all these slides online, too, later if you guys want them for your notes. Um, everybody got that? Any questions? No? We're good? OK, cool. So the exposure triangle is an analogy to explain the main elements that affect the exposure of a photograph. It's a fancy way of saying this is what makes a photograph. These are the three main elements that are your creative tools 
for the technical making of a picture. So what is a stop? Anybody know what a stop is? No, you're, you're excluded. <laughs> Pianchi, you've been here before. Moving up or down regarding a stop as far as aperture, that's pretty close. So a stop is a movement in either the ISO, the shutter, or the aperture. And what a stop does is it doubles or halves the amount. So we have here, these are our, our apertures. So we go from 1.4, I'm, I'm pointing to here, or behind me, 1.4 to, actually, here, I'll just go over here. So 1.4, we doubled to 2. 2 goes to 2.8. And then F4, they round a little bit, but every time we're doubling or we're halving our measurement. So in all of, in all of the uh, parts of the triangle, you're either doubling or halving. So in your ISO, we're going from 100 to 200 to 400 to 800 to 16, et cetera, and then we're coming back. So, yeah. What are we doubling The measurement. For what, for what, what, what thing is the amount of light? Oh, the amount of light. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm, yeah, you, got, you got me stumped, so I don't, I don't know the exact question you're asking. Yeah, so you're saying doubling happening? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the amount of light that's coming in in each one of those aspects. Sorry. I apologize. Right. Okay. Are we good? Everybody got that? I apologize if I was not clear on that. Um, so we have our aperture, our shutter speed, and our ISO. So those are the three aspects of how we bring light into the camera that all work together. So they're a team. Uh, if anybody used to watch wrestling, kind of tagging in. Jumping over the rope. <laughs> that's uh, that's eight-year-old Scott talking. <laughs> right, right, yeah, okay. Forty-three-year-old Scott is uh, probably doesn't have time for wrestling right nowadays, other than going to jujitsu. Uh, shutter speed is the length of time the shutter of the camera is open and exposing the sensor to light. I probably should have asked you guys about that first, but. So how do we think about that? Um, it's basically the length of time your camera sensor is exposed to the outside light. Shutter curtains sit in front of the camera sensor and block the light. When you take a pic, the curtain moves out of the way, allowing the light to hit the sensor. So we think about this is what your shutter speed is. It's literally just a little curtain opening and closing. And the higher the number, the faster the curtain moves. Everybody got that? Yeah? Sure you got it, Terrence? <laughs> oh, Tracy, you don't got it. <laughs> Photo battle. Okay, so when we use our shutter speed, we are manipulating how fast the image or the capture of the image, right? So if we have a really fast shutter speed, we're going to get stillness. So as we can see, my skateboarder friend from Unsplash. Um, <laughs> who doesn't use Unsplash in their presentations nowadays? Uh, he's frozen, right? He's frozen in time. So we had like a really fast shutter speed, anywhere from, I'm going to say, 500 and up. You good, Naima? Cool. All right. We want a larger number. Okay. Yeah. So a larger number equates to stillness in the shot. If we want motion in the shot, then we're going to have a smaller number. So this is probably around somewhere around the shutter speed of a 60th of a second or a 30th of a second. I don't know. Trey, what'd you shoot it at? Eighth of a second? Okay. 
So we could say anywhere down from like 125 down. <laughs> He's getting thumbs up from the crowd. All right. Uh, 125 down, you're going to get motion blur. Unless you have really, really still hand. Well, you're, you're going to get motion blur, yeah. There's a trick to this. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you can do a panning shot like this one, which I think I shot at either a 60th or a 30th of a second, because after that, I, I'm out of control. Um, so you, what you can do is you can OG1 in the house. Uh, what you can do is, yes. Yes, so with this shot, I've, I've tried, I did the best I could to focus on the person, and then I'm literally holding my camera, and I'm kind of moving the camera with the person. I'm kind of whipping the camera along so that if I'm lucky, then I get this. This is really the combination of just math and luck. Uh, so this is around like 30th or 60th of a second. So th these two are the same shot just with movement of the camera to match the object, and then no movement of the camera. Everybody got that? We're good? Okay. Uh, this is, so this is the same shot also, but my camera is still, and my model is moving. Obviously, there's not four of her, but <laughs> um, same idea is we're using movement in the shot by slowing, by we call it dragging the shutter. So we're dragging the shutter down. Um, and then same shot as well. I'm, I'm showing you a couple of these to give you ideas of how you can use the same mechanic in different ways to be creative. So this one, I just zoomed the lens in. I think I had a flash that popped that kind of froze them in time. But we'll get to that later. But again, slow movement on the shutter. We get a shutter drag, and we get the... Um, we have motion in the shot. Was that like one second curtain? It probably was on the second curtain. So second curtain is a more technical term. So no, it's fine. That's, I didn't even think to talk about that. So that's actually a really good question. So what the second curtain is, is, and I might mess this up, so clear it up if I'm wrong. Your camera opens up the shutter, and then it closes the shutter. When the tr flash triggers, it can either trigger at the opening or right before the closing, and I think that's how sh second cutter shutter works. Um, it, f it, it triggers around the second, the second closing, so you get, I don't know, Sergio, do you? Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> I've, I haven't thought about second shutter in a long time. That's a good question, <laughs> or second curtain. Um, so, yeah, so, so with the shutter speed, everybody gets that the larger the number is the faster your, sh your curtain is opening and closing, the smaller the number, the slower, the, and so we have, we're capturing movement. So your shutter speed is, is all about movement. So next is the aperture. Anybody, anybody new know what the aperture is? No, 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 okay. Your aperture in photography is the opening of a lens diaphragm uh, through which the light, pass, the light passes through. So if we can imagine everybody's got an eyeball, right? You know when you're in a really dark room and you come out into a really bright setting, you're like, Jesus Christ, bright as hell out. That is, your, that is your aperture at work. That means that your eye is very far open. The aperture is very far open of your eye, and it's letting a ton of light in, and it needs to close down so that it can, so you can see again. So that's exactly what our aperture is. So this is your eye of the camera. It's literally what it looks like. You might have seen it. Um, it just opens and closes and lets light in and out. There's another part of aperture which is called depth of field. And this is the most important thing that you should understand about, well, I think the most important thing that you should understand. So depth of field is how, well, anybody know what depth of field is? The, the, range, of what's in focus. the range of what's in focus. 
So the smaller your depth of field is, I'm going to go back here again. The smaller your depth of field is, or I mean, the smaller your depth of field number is, the smaller the amount of things that are in focus, right? So now we get demonstration time. Naima. <laughs> My wonderful assistant. <laughs> All right, so you stand right there. Okay. So this is hypothetically one point oh see I need you to you're gonna have to back up through there so okay so hypothetically let's say this is 1.4 in our aperture this is how much room is in focus on our lens there's variations by different lenses but we won't get into that today that's a little bigger so if we go to like f4 let's have you take like a step or two back this is how much is in focus if we go to let's say f8 so take like two steps back this is how much it's in focus. If we go to F11, let's say two more steps back. This is how much it's in focus. If we go to F16, take one step. And then F22, go all the way to the back. This is how much it's in focus. So this is how your aperture works. As your Okay, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Not a, sorry, my bad. I didn't mean. So this is like... If the higher your number, you're getting a lot more in focus from your camera lens. And then as the number goes down, Naima comes back. Oh, hopefully your camera doesn't do anything like this. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Does everybody get that? Everybody got that? So that's kind of the trickiest part to get about aperture is your number controls how much is in focus but it's also how much light is coming in. So the further it is out, the higher the number is and the less amount of light it's letting in, which is kind of counterintuitive. So. You wanna? Oh, I mean, I can explain it, but if you, no, go ahead. I'm, I mean, if you got something. Um, the reason it might feel a little counterintuitive, to like why the smaller number is bigger, because it's a fraction. It's a fraction of the diameter of the circle. So one, meaning one over one, would be bigger than 5.6 over one, or I mean the inverse, right? So that's why it might seem counterintuitive. So the closer you get to one, more of the diameter you're getting. Everybody get that? Cool. All right. Uh, any questions about depth of field? No? It's going to be a test later. <laughs> There's not going to be any tests. I'm just. Good answer. <laughs> okay, so yeah, depth of field, we got it. Measurement. Um, a shallow depth of field is used from, just a refresh, uses the lower f stops. One to F four to emphasize, 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 and detail and intimacy of an object and a person. So we're talking about shooting people in this class, right? So if we have a shallow depth of field, these are just photographic examples of very shallow depth of field. Anybody know which movie this is from? You're not, yeah, well, he already beat you to it. Inception. <laughs> Oh, you, do you understand it? I watched it because I dreamed of my dream. Ah, okay. He, he watched it in a dream of a dream. Inception. So when we're emphasizing uh, with a short depth of field, we're usually trying to allude to something that is very important. Uh, there might also be a subject in the background, like this image, which is um, from another movie. Anybody know what movie this is from? Cloud Atlas. Good film. So this is like the creepy dude talking to Tom Hanks. It's like Tom Hanks' is subconscious. And anyways. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> uh, but so we can use depth of field to emph emph emphasize. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that today. Some type of emph intimacy or important subject. So 
again, we're, we're showing our subject is the most important thing in the frame. Anybody know what this movie is? All right, it's a pop popular <laughs> film. <laughs> okay, so, and it might be something where we're showing something looming in the distance, like this movie. Everybody knows what this movie is, yeah? No, yeah? Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. <laughs> Correct, Finding Nemo. Uh, okay, so a medium depth of field uses the lower F stops of... 5.6 to F8 to emphasize connection to a person or to a group or a smaller surrounding. So we're in that middle range of the, uh, of the tape measure now, right? So like me to Naima. So in this, we're showing connection to a group, right? So you can see her, she's in the middle of the frame, but still people are in focus and you, and you see that, they're, that everything is tied together. Who, who knows this one? Mad Max? You could just yell it out. If you know it, just yell it out. All right. Again, we have two different groups. The <laughs> good fellas. And then I forgot the name of this movie. I got it from screen grab. Uh, but yeah, so you can see clearly that there's an identification of, of a group of people. Oh, snap. You guys are in for a treat. Come on down, man. <laughs> right. Uh, Cola just walked in for all the online people. Um, and so, again, we have center figure, but also the people in the front and the people at the back, even though they're a little soft-focused, are still in focus so you can see the connection of the group. Right? Uh, everybody know this movie? Yes. It's an amazing film. Amazing film. <laughs> a wide depth of field uses the lower f-stops of f11 to f22 to emphasize the larger picture in which everything is in focus right so another mad max thing we can see that there's this crazy group of people the frame is fire literally <laughs> uh so we can see the connection right we can see this wasn't shot at f22 but everything's in focus i think this drone only does F. Oh, what's the question online? What are the stops from medium depth of field? Uh, the stops from medium depth of field are F5.6 to F8. I don't need to go all the way back. We good? Okay, cool. Um, aperture is also used to explain lighting ratios, which help to create the mood of the images. And we'll get into the depth in this. Uh, later in the class, but sometimes we're using aperture to ex explain like moody lighting, we're focusing on a subject, we're using it to explain our lighting setup. So uh, again, this is something we'll get into way later, but just to glaze over it, you can have a key light set to a certain aperture on a reading. We use what's called a light meter. So we could say this is F8 on this, but on this light behind me, I want it at f5.6, and then we have two different light exposures that we're using to create a mood, but that's, we'll get into that much further along. Uh, what is ISO? <laughs> Clearly, James Harden knows, because that's all he plays. He's not a team player. <laughs> um, anybody know what ISO is? Artificial light. Artificial light? Yeah. No. <laughs> But it can register artificial light. It's a way of increasing the, the light, but without increasing the brightness. Yeah. So you're saying that increases too much, you're going to get a grainy image. Okay, that's a good explanation, a way of increasing light, but if you get too much, you'll get a grainy image. Close. Your ISO can be defined as the amplification of light captured by the camera, on, which is received by your sensor. So basically, the ISO is the level of absorption by your film stock or your sensor. So hopefully I got the next slide where I want it to be. Think of your sensor as a sponge. <laughs> the level of ISO, if it's low, is going to have a very small, you're gonna have very small holes in your sponge. If 
You like that analogy? Yeah? All right. The higher your ISO, the bigger the holes are going to be in your sponge, and the larger your grain is. Your grain is connected to your holes in your sponge. So think about, like, if you ever made art, and you got the sponge, and you're, like, stamping the sponge around. If you got the sponge with the bigger holes, you got more grain. If you got the sponge with the smaller holes, you got less grain. That's, that's the way to think about it. Huh? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's my guy right here. It's, it's my spiritual mentor. Him and Sugar Free. <laughs> Just kidding about Sugar Free. Not SpongeBob. Um, okay, so your ISO scale. If you want to, if you, if we have bright sunlight, we want to have really small holes because we have an abundance of light. So we need a small grain. Because what happens if you have a huge flow of water into a sponge with big holes? You're going to get a ton of absorption, right? I should have, like, brought a bucket of water and did a whole thing, but that would be very messy. <laughs> uh, and then if we have low light, then we want a larger hole in our sponge to absorb more light, and we're going to get more grain, right? Some people, I'm not one of those people, I don't think Dre is one of those people, believe that if you have a lot of grain, you don't have a good photo. I don't think that's true. I think grain can help you tell the story. So I think that's silly. I think that's saying, like, if I have a wood grain that's, you know, has a certain amount of texture that's a bad wood, I don't think that's true. I think you use, a, you use the right kind of wood for the right kind of job, and if it fits, then you have a story. So... You know, the downside, like I said, of ISO is you do lose clarity with more grain. So your image isn't as sharp. So if we're shooting something that we need to be really sharp, we do want to have that small hole in the sponge because we don't want a lot of noise. But if we're shooting something that doesn't need to be sharp, then we can have as much as we want. Um, and so why have an I high ISO? Like I said, it's timeless, it's texture. Grain is beautiful, right? If you add texture to something, you add another creative element that might bring another level of beauty that you weren't expecting. Yes. Noise is grain. Grain is noise. So, uh, but yeah, your grain is the amount of fuzz in your photo. So you can see. I'll just go here. This is the grain right here. Um, and it's the noise also, so, yeah. But noise is, that's a good question, because noise is particular to sharpness, right? So if, if we're shooting something that's sharp, we don't want a lot of noise, which means we don't want a, a lot of variation in our line, right? We want, like, a very straight line. If we have a noisy uh, l photo, then we're not going to have a very sh straight line. It's going to have a lot of bumps, and, you know, it won't be the same. So here we have, <clears throat> I think the top three are all Gordon Parks photos, one of the greatest photographers that ever picked up a camera. Uh, it's your homie? It's your uncle? Uh, Demondre Parks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't, remember, I don't recall where I got this lower frame from, but clearly it's an old film photo. Uh, another Gordon Parks image from The Invisible Man, collaboration he did. Um, beautiful photo, timeless photo. You could take this photo today if you know what you're doing and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between when it was shot and now. I mean, this is the wonderful thing about this photo is you really don't, unless you know who shot it, you don't know when it was taken. Uh, so again, timeless, right? And you can see the grain in the shot here. You can see there's a register of grain. You can pick it up a little bit in the shadows of the shot. So so that's the reason for shooting high ISO, ISO is you get a texture. It almost feels like a painting. As to where if we shot this at 100, you would this would just be a very solid shape with like just, you know, it would just be a shape with a flat color. Um, more film photos, just to kind of show you the beauty of, beauty of grain. So know your sensor. So everybody in here, you got your camera, uh, Claudette, Wait, no, not Claudette. 
What's up? Yeah. You got your, your uh, sorry, I called you your own name, but the, the iPhone is a camera also. So what we want you to do is stress test your um, sensor. So how do you do that? You take it into a bunch of different environments and see how it performs. Just see what your camera does in really low light, what it does in really bright light, see what it does when you're shooting something in motion. Just get familiar with your sensor because that is uh, what is gonna be generating all your images. So you wanna see what it's capable of. Um, you wanna see where it feels good for you and, and where it doesn't feel so good. So like some stuff you're gonna shoot in low light and you'd be like, oh wow, this is really grainy. I'm really gonna need to, to shoot stuff that has grain with this camera. Some cameras won't pick up as much light as well as other cameras will. Some cameras really perform really well in low light and some cameras don't. Is there anything else you wanna say about stress test in the uh, sensor? being that it's a tool you need to learn, right? So if you're going in a situation and the light levels are, say you like, oh, I have to shoot at 3200 ISO, and you know, yo, my camera cannot do this, right? So, but it's situations where certain cameras, like if you have a job or you're gonna go shoot an event at night and you have, a, you have multiple cameras, and knowing like, oh, I'm shooting this jazz event in the evening, I know which camera I'm gonna take because I know how the sensor performs in this setting. Um, being that, I'll probably speak for myself, I'm a, I'm a camera hoarder, so I have gear paralysis when I leave the house sometimes because I'm like, yo, I don't know which camera to take, but they're all different tools for different jobs. So just knowing that, being that you have one tool, learn it really well, so if you have to, Usually another good test and to test what, how your camera deals with noise is called the lens cap test. You basically run through all your ISOs with the lens cap on, mm -hmm. then you record an image at every ISO, then put them in Lightroom, and then basically since noise lives in the shadows 90% of the time, you'll start seeing when the noise starts creeping into the image because it's all shadows. Demandre, everybody, Demandre. <laughs> Uh, another reason to like stress test your sensor is, I should have used a slide for this. Anybody, what's up? Oh, Cole, you have a question? Oh, you wanna? Cola. Okay. Now, I just wanted to add that with the whole knowing your sensor joint is like, think about like your car. Every car has gear one, gear two, gear three, gear four but your, your Peugeot or your Beetle won't rock like an Audi. So know the level of, <laughs> that's, that's, that's no the best. No matter how fast you drive that Honda down. Yeah, down like down your, down your, down your, down your, down your, 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 your gears on your Honda won't respond like your gears on your Audi. So that's why you gotta know the capabilities of your, of the sensors on your camera. So that way, it stops you from doing that one question that annoys a lot of photographers. Hey, what setting did you shoot that on? It's like, <laughs> it works on my camera, it might not work on yours. That setting might not work on yours. Then the reason why is because of that guy right there. Right. <laughs> and to his point, anybody seen uh, this movie? Who made, I can't remember. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Tangerine? No? What's it? I haven't seen this movie. Anyways, the movie I'm talking about, that the peanut gallery is not talking about, is uh, Apocalypse Now. Anybody, or not Apocalypse Now. Damn, what's it called? I just forgot. You messed me up. Damn it. It's about the, it's about the military. The one with Gomer Pyle. Um, uh huh. You, it happened to you too. Not Heard Locker. Um, Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket. Anybody seen this film? Full Metal Jacket. This is my weapon. This is this is my weapon. There are many like it, but this one is mine. 
Without my weapon, I am nothing. Without me, my weapon is nothing. Treat your camera like your best friend. I always tell people ABC, always bring your camera. Get to know it, you know, get to know it in and out. So when, I think I remember the first time I seen it. But I've seen that movie a lot. It's a great, it's a great movie. Um, but yeah, get to know your camera, like make it your friend. So when the shot is coming and you see the shot coming down the line, uh, you're like, oh, I'm ready. I know what, I know what to do. So, um, yeah, this is about stress tests. When does it start to get noisy? When render color shift, it's all about balance, right? So figuring out between the three things, how to balance out your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. The balance of the three, we get a perfect exposure. Um, and then I think that's it. Is we finished or is we done? <laughs> um, any questions? No? <laughs> Me, slide god. What's up? Oh, we're waiting online? Okay. So, and I kind of I kind of didn't really, I guess, lead into this, but if you get all three right, if you get your ISO right, your aperture, your shutter speed right, you have your perfect exposure, right? They all work together in conjunction to get the proper exposure. But the proper exposure is also subjective because do you want motion in your shot? Do you want stillness in your shot? Do you want grain in your shot? Do you want your shot to be sharp? How much of your shot do you want to be in focus, right? So there's all those things. And it, that's when the creative component comes in, and that's when the storytelling comes in. Now you look at one of the shots that made Gordon Parks famous, I wish I had it here, is of a woman dancing, and she, he's spinning the camera as she's spinning, and so she's slightly in focus, but there's a lot of blur around the edges of her, and there's this beautiful color in the shot. And he could have shot it where she was really still and boring, but he chose to move. He chose to have a certain amount of play in the aperture, a certain, certain amount of play in the uh, shutter speed. And so that's what you're really doing here. Is you're taking these mechanics of these three things, and then the world is yours. So, yeah, all right. I think that's it. See you next time for everybody online, unless you want to meet us uh, outside. We all suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got time. So, should we do it outside? We do it outside? Who wants to be inside? Let's take a vote. Who wants to be inside? Who wants to be outside? Inside people. Outside people. All right, outside it is. All right. Yeah, I'm about to tell about the exercise now. All right, so the exercise for today is going to be a twofer. It's an exercise that I've picked up in kind of journeying where I'm at and just trying to grow. I call it, a, I call it 36 shots. It's basically you find an object or an area and you shoot it 36 different. You're going to gas out by 15. <laughs> You're going to get, oh, okay. Did they hear me online? So, yeah, 36 shots, right? So, you find an area or an object and shoot it 36 different ways. It could be a bottle. It could be a tape measure. It could be a street corner. It could be a structure. It could be a person. Um, the reason being, we're practicing, one, you're going to use your exposure triangle to try to get the most out of the 36 shots, right? So, after you get your regular exposures and your intuition from composition you're you're going to start slowing down and it's just a state of mindfulness really we're practicing that it's basically how do i see how many ways can i see this because when you have a person in front of you or a subject in front of you we always going to default to our instinct is how much deeper can i go and the more you practice how much more mindfulness you can build and how deeper you can go the easier it's going to be to call up those situations so Question. Uh huh. Oh, good question, Brooke. 
We're figuring it out right now. Um, so there might be an hour in between. So if we fin we start at 11, we finish, what time we finish today, like 1230? It's 1230? They say, depending on the location, and you'll have ac you'll know the location before class start. It'll be in the invite. So next week, just heads up. We're doing composition. We're going to do our infamous scavenger hunt. We're probably going to go to San Francisco. So, being that class is online, you could probably watch in your headphones, get some coffee, chill out, and wait for everybody to get there, or start the assignment early and just be outside shooting all day, right? So it'll just it'll de depend on what's happening that day. Right, so being that we're central, we're here, I would just give everybody an hour to get to the location next week and to get a snack or get re recharged or whatever, right? Um, so, yeah, but that's something we can always discuss in my network before class. So, yeah, for folks online, do the exercise. You don't need, you could do it with your iPhone. I do it with my iPhone at the house all the time. Um, being a lot of the beginners, if you have your camera, use this time to work on exposure triangle and learning how that works. And make a sheet and po post it online and kind of just tell us what you found out about yourself. You'll, it'll start to tell on you. You'll start to see what you favor, kind of where your blind spots are. You start realizing what composition and what elements you don't mess with. Like I have, me personally, I have a hard time with negative space. <laughs> And I learned that from doing this com doing this exercise all the time. Terrence just raised his hand. Or is it like point blank? Is it class every week or? It's every other week. So, oh, okay. yeah, no, it's every other week. Every two weeks. So, was it second and fourth Saturday? Right. Okay. Um, okay. We'll wait about 30 seconds. And we could build this exercise outside somewhere, or we could stay here and kind of set up and just find some stuff. I would say being that there is two, four, there's almost pairs, so pair up. It's easier to kind of figure this stuff out uh, with, a per, with a teammate. If you are a more advanced photographer, team up with someone who's just starting, please help us out and help them out. We can just do this easy. Pick your fast food cheat, buddy. Oh, and there then, you go. And then oh. there you go. <laughs> Is there any questions online? All right. We'll see folks online in Mighty Network. Please log in, tap in. See y'all in two weeks online. Um, I'll see y'all later. Peace.